Muff Muffman. Man. Yeah, what, what's the fascination with that? Yeah, one? why are you sexually attracted to Muffman? <laughs> <laughs> Hashtag horny for Muffman. Uh, <laughs> Hello, rock and rollers. This is the Mystical Fools Podcast. Your boys, Calibri's, that's Davey, Jimmy, and Bobby. Today we're talking to Argyle Goosby. So, nice. Goosby, episode no. nine. You're our first official goddamn guest. We're start. We're starting this. The revolution. <laughs> and I was like, like who, who, who would be the best first guest? Our arch enemy for a million years, Goosby. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yes. get Calabrese's is <laughs> dressed to impress for all the audio listeners. Nah, oh, not my watch. Oh, oh shit! I didn't even. Yeah, you ain't you ain't out lost up lost boy me whatever it is. Oh shit! Oh, yeah. We got Bobby yeah, Morrison. Let me ask you this: Do either of you guys, you might have a Miller Light can, but do you have a Werewolf of London microphone? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> outspooking us! Oh, this thing on. Hello, hello. Calabrese. Oh, oh, there you go. Yeah, we got tricks and treats. Hey. <laughs> I've got those too, man. That's what so, that's what I have yeah. in my mouth right now. So those are yes. my let's let's <laughs> jump let's jump right into it. Okay, we're spot spooks, goofs, gas and laughs. Um good to so, have, I was gonna say good to have you, at least, right? Yes. Well, thank you. It's good to see you. <laughs> good to be on. We, good to be invited. Thank you. Yes. Um, so we saw on the internet you moving around coffins in daylight. What's the deal, dog? Where are you going with those? SPF six six six, man. That's oh good. Okay, good. That's good. You gotta you gotta you gotta you gotta I had my I had Brad, he's my buddy, he's like my Rinfield, you know what I mean? So he's like there yeah. with he's got the little scrim. So we just photoshopped it to make it look like it was daylight. <laughs> Ah, uh, yeah. Very, very, very outre move on, on our end. So, All right. uh, no, so those are my coffins, man. I've had those for years and years and years, and they've just been sitting in storage. Um, so it was time to move them up here. I need a guest bed. <laughs> I love it, dude. Ghouls. Oh my God. We're vibing. So, <laughs> should I, should I leave? No. <laughs> so, so, you have coffins. There's literally a coffin in this room. Let's see. I can show you here. Uh -oh. uh, right there, dude. Ooh. Not as cool as this coffin, I gotta say. Well, we got old. We got an old school coffin here with some cobwebs, of course. But you got them. You got them new. The new school coffins. So I will. I will refrain from commenting where the one came from because I refuse <laughs> to incriminate myself. However. Um, the other one came from um, a friend of mine who, uh, when I was tattooing in West Virginia, he would come in all the time like, hey, bringing me dead animals and like roadkill and stuff for free tattoos. Well, it just so happened to be that uh, he was also uh, like an independent contractor. And at the time they were demolishing a house. And the town that I live in is like full of full of old houses, like in certain parts of you know the, the city. And um, they found it in the basement. And it was it was pretty much just like behind a bunch of old coal uh, paraphernalia. And uh, it, it, I don't, there was no one in it, man. But I mean, the wooden one is, is very right. old. Right. It's very old. Are you from Salem's Lot? What's going on here? Yeah. <laughs> is that the plot to Salem's Lot? Yeah, it does sound like a <laughs> From parts all you... over, man. My best friend, the Toad Brothers. <laughs> oh, my God. So I, I'm the frog. <laughs> um, First time I never heard of you or Blitzkin was Antidote Records. You remember Antidote Records? Oh my God, I do. Yes. <laughs> it's so great to see all the success that that you've had since then, and in the future, seeing what you're doing with uh, your own Goolsby band, and that you guys are back together doing that, uh, doing the stuff. You're going on tour, doing the anniversary stuff. Blitzkid, that's so great. Um, well, yes, you. really to see that you guys are are still doing it, and you know. Uh, throughout all these years, so we've seen so many bands come and go, and it's so great to see such a great band that's keep thriving. And thank you uh, very much, man. Great. Yeah, we're actually just waiting for um, you to quit so we become the only band. <laughs> <laughs> Never. It was it was all just a ploy on our end. We're just like, all right, all right, let's let everybody think we're gone, and then we're gonna come back. And uh, just 
<laughs> no, man, I, you know, I, and I want to say too, like, um, just, you know, on behalf of us, man, like, congratulations, you guys are, how long have you been a band now? How long have you been uh, yeah, we're a brand new band. Um, <laughs> you know what I'm We just started. <laughs> you guys are, you guys are coming up on like two decades now almost, right? Hey, whoa, whoa, <laughs> Johnny, why <Black> count? <laughs> so, but no, Okay, man, you got, you got us. I, 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 I'm, I'm very happy to see you guys doing what you're doing, man. Honestly, like, you guys have continued to grow with every album. I always love seeing experimentation, like, you know, Lust for Sacrilege, Born with the Scorpions Touch, all that, man. You know, all your stuff has always been, you've never been afraid to go out and do your own thing, man. You know what I mean? And still call it horror rock. And that's what I think horror rock's about, personally. Not that, you know, I, I know what it is, but, you know, that's the way we approach it. We've never really tried to just pigeonhole ourselves um, into just doing one thing. And we, we tend to kind of, like, keep you know to it to a i don't know like a, i don't want to say predictable but kind of a a steady course with um you know what we do but i don't know man i mean i think it's good it's good to see so congratulations thank you sir thank yeah, you I cool can, can, Son of i think what uh you did thank you. Thank you. I think thank you. I think what <laughs> I think what makes you guys so successful you and, and, and uh, everyone that you work uh, yeah, TV. So you guys are authentic, and you you love the stuff. So monster think, kids. Yeah, like true monster kids, like uh, you know, everyone that really gets it and loves it. Um, yeah, I think that's that yeah. that shines through. And your attention to detail. I want to say this too. Like even with the new new uh, music video that you put out, like just yeah, the attention to detail you guys have, and just the love, and it's just everything comes through. And it's just so uh, authentic and beautiful. I, I'll say it, beautiful. You got you guys have this beautiful. <laughs> Man, I, I want I want to come on this podcast more often. <laughs> <laughs> all right, we got all the stupid mushy stuff out of the way. <laughs> but, but, uh, cool we wanted, to, but we just wanted to start off by celebrating, you know, uh, celebrating you and uh, your music. Well, so. thank you, man. I, I really do sincerely appreciate it, and, and back at you. Thank. Uh, the last band standing podcast. <laughs> 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 He's going to be the last one. Here's a, the gauntlet. Who's going to quit first? Well, Goolsby, is this true? You put out a bunch of Blitzkid merch, merch recently, and you sold out in five minutes. Is this is this a fact? Uh, close. It was nine minutes. <laughs> <laughs> but who's, oh, who's counting? Who's counting? <laughs> I love that. That's, that's fucking good, man. It, it was surprising, man, to be honest with you. I, you know, I got up and I, I walked away for a moment just because I was like, ah, you know, push the big red live button or whatever and, and um, came back and I thought there was something wrong with the store. I was like, oh, no, there's an issue. <laughs> like, we're all about to go. <laughs> yeah, it was sold out. And I was just like, and I'm like looking in the on the back end of the store to make sure everything was was right. And, and it was. So I was like, well, I guess. I guess that's it. <laughs> it's like Christmas morning, man. You know what I mean? You kind of get all geared up for it. You're excited. And then your presents are unwrapped and you're like, all right. So what, I guess, what now? <laughs> you said, well, we should have made more. What did we put? <laughs> well, like, like our dad would always tell me, I would say, dad, we sold out. And he, and I would expect, you know, like a, a pat on the back, a hug. Yes. Yes. I got that. But then, then when the hugs and the cheering was out, he goes, okay, what's next? <laughs> you just got to keep going. Keep opening those Christmas uh, presents up. He's a pro, uh, man. Yeah. <laughs> so I saw in a feed somewhere that, um, I think it was like Facebook. This is the feed moving up and down. You guys played a show, Bliss Kid. It was like, I don't know what, what year it was, but somewhere like it was Germany or something like that, one of those, one of those festivals. And the place was packed. It was just, man, you guys uh, – Back in the day, when you could tour, you know, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> last year when you tour, <laughs> those festivals were, were amazing over overseas. Yeah. You guys were doing. They were a lot of fun. fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they were a lot of fun, man. Um, you know, it, Europe kind of was an accident for us. It was one of those things where we we got on the This Is Horror Punk compilation, which you guys were on too when they put the I think the second one out, right? The next year, um, we just happened to get on it because at the time. Um, I was doing freelance artwork for a lot of different people on the internet. And uh, there was a company called Loud and Sick, and they were just like a music review site. And I was just trying to be proactive and get my artwork out there. And I was hitting up a bunch of different companies and, uh, you know, they had gotten back to me and was like, yeah, sure, do some artwork for us. And uh, that I met a guy named Dennis who was kind of like heading that whole thing. Um, 
And then it wasn't too much longer after that, that Dennis had contacted me and said, I know a guy who is putting out a record label, uh, kind of catering to a lot of the styles of music like you do, like Blitz Kid does. Um, and I told him about you and, uh, you know, he wants to know if you would be interested in being on the compilation. And we were like, yeah, man, absolutely. You know, so we sent, um, Trace of a Stranger to them. And that's when I ended up getting contact with, uh, Torsten over there. And from there, um, you know, the CD came out, they put it on vinyl and I guess, you know, it did well, you know, they had really good distribution. I was working at FYE at the time at the mall and I remember getting it and I was like, holy shit, we're like, we're in FYE. This is crazy. Um, <laughs> And, uh, you know, more or less what happened was the response was good for it. And uh, they had hit us up and said, well, listen, you know, the record that this came off of, it would be cool if we we put it out and maybe put you guys on tour. So um, we honestly didn't really have any clue what to expect. But we said, sure, you know, we're not going to pass the opportunity. So um, our first tour over there was about, I think, like 11 shows. We were touring with a band called The Spook. And, um, you know, like... That was it, man. We were over there. We did uh, 11 or 12 shows and then we came home and really we weren't doing anything for about a year in terms of like Europe or anything at all um, until they approached us about doing a new record. And that's when Five Sellers Below kind of became a thing. And from that point forward, you know, we just were touring over there a lot because then they were backing it. You know, they had that record backed and, um, you know, Europe is no no shortage of festivals, <laughs> you know what I mean? So, and that's the cool thing is like, you know, you go over there, at least from our experience and, um, you know, you can play for as many people in one day as you would in an entire four week, five week tour in some instances, which is really cool. Um, yeah. yeah one big one. Bang for the buck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. But no, yeah, it's, it, it was good for us, man. Um, I think horror punk was at that time really new. Uh, the only bands that were doing it um, at the time was the blood sucking zombies from outer space um, over in Austria. And then there was the other, and then there was the crimson ghost, but the crimson ghosts and the other at that point in time were only uh, misfit cover bands. Hence the names. Um, uh, so I what see. it was, was once we, I mean, the other had a song, they had the song beware of ghouls, but, uh, once the This Is Horror Punk compilation came out and they saw the success with that and, uh, you know, how well all the, the CDs were doing and the licensing that they did of Trace of a Stranger, that's when they decided to move forward with the other as a band. Because prior to that, they were called The Ghouls and they were only playing on Halloween with the Crimson Ghosts uh, in Cologne and doing like Misfit sets. So it was a new thing, man. You know, like when we went over there, it was people had never really seen it, you know, and... Not that it was really even a big thing here. I mean, you guys were, you guys have been doing it for a long, long time, you know? So it's not like there really was a scene even back in 2003, 2004. You had like message boards, like Antidote um, and a couple of other places, but I don't think it had really reached what it is now. So and I think it grew because we, we, we just started like a few years after you guys did. We didn't even know it was a thing. Like Bobby's friend was like, hey, there's like this record label called antidote that kind of doing the same thing you guys are so it like grew organically it was it wasn't even that's the neat thing it was just how it just it was just mushrooming up it was in the uh universe at the time and all these bands just started popping up when it when it did so yeah no i i agree it was just the right time for for all of that and for everything um you know because once it did spring up and with you guys uh with us you know over here doing what we're doing and then once you know europe uh, the European market and all that stuff, I guess, started kind of coming together with, you know, more and more bands. You know, then there was guys like Nimvind who, you know, I mean, he was, he's been doing it since Mr. Underhill days, uh, but he wasn't necessarily like calling himself horror punk. You know what I mean? Just like, I don't think we weren't really even calling ourselves horror punk when we first started because we, didn't, you know, we didn't know just like you guys, I, I'm sure you weren't like, we're a horror punk band. It was just like, this is what we do. Um, yeah, it, it just kind of became that. And everyone just kind of fell under that banner. Just like, like with Nimvind. That's how we met him um, was through Fiend Force. Um, but, you know, they yeah. really had a lot to do with bringing a lot of those bands together and, and, and Antidote too, you know, to, to a certain degree. It's just that Antidote wasn't really, um, you know, I don't think it was really like structured very well. Do you know what I mean? I don't think they really had a plan for Antidote. It just kind of <laughs> popped up yeah. and, and then it just disappeared. <laughs> <laughs> the best way to put it. <laughs> I remember he... I think it was the story someone saying like they didn't get their, uh, mm, their CDs because oh. uh, Sindo had some kid neighborhood kid was supposed to go mail them and like 
The kid didn't. He was like, he found him in the kid's room. He was just sitting next to his bed. We were like, where did he put my back to this? So, yeah, definitely no structure at all. It's just kind of like definitely uh, DIY. Uh, no, <laughs> a lot of trial. Like most it definitely of was, man. You know, and the thing is, is like it, it existed okay, I think, at that point in time because a lot of the bands, ourselves included, were just happy uh, for the exposure. I mean, as we still are, you know, it's it, it, it's still about that. Um, but, you know, at some point you want to go record another record and it'd be nice to have money to do that. So, you know, you're like, hey, haven't you been selling our records? Um, maybe we can get some of that so we can write a new record. And then it's just, you know, you get the the rigmarole and it's just like, oh, OK, all right. I see how I see what's happening here. <laughs> All right, Bobby, we've got some songwriter questions. Oh, speak, Bobby, speak. We got him here. (laughs) I'm very happy to see all three of you, by the way. I I really do appreciate you all being here, man. It's nice to see you. It really is. I'm not just being full of shit, like, or trying to be cheeky. Like, I, I, when when, when Jimmy told me, or uh, when Davey told me we were going to do like a Calabrese uh, episode, I was like, there better be all three Calabreses there. I want to see all three Calabreses. So, Uh, let's see you you know, just ask the question. He's got this. How do you write songs? Yeah, you how do you write songs? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my, oh, your first time. How do I write songs? Um, I mean, that's the question. That's the question, Bob. I'm trying to get your face out of the way. This oh my, my time. god, dude! You do it like this. There, <laughs> there you go. go. That's all, Bob. You know, I need, I need my face on it. There, oh, there. there. Look, uh, said, Bob. You know, you're uh, hey, pretty, pretty good. Like, oh my god, it's a mirror! <laughs> oh my god, dude, the mu- oh my god, what's going on here? Don't wait, wait, do this. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows Who knows? Yes, dude. Oh my god, yes. <laughs> what the hell? Oh, so you're, you're uh, one of us. Goofy, yeah, you're one of us, Michael. I mean, Goolsby. What I was gonna say. Uh, having a- David told me we were having a vampire party, so I, I dressed That's up. Vampire party. Um, songwriting. Big, lustrous career. In the roving midnight. How do you write songs? From one tortured artist to another. <laughs> uh, you have yourself a, a set of, you, you know, you, you, you drugs and then you stare into the sun and, uh, you know. <laughs> what do you do? What do, you, do? Uh, you take some. Yeah, some kind of ritual you got to do. You got to pale steak in the head. Yeah, I, I, I have this, I have this, uh, this gray jogging suit, and I just pop on the doors, and I just drink a lot of magic Kool Aid and start soupy dancing. Um, <laughs> no, man, really, um, it, it's, it's probably. I mean, I don't know how it is for you guys, uh, you know, because I should ask you guys some questions too. But, um, um, yeah. it's, it's not really, I, I don't vampire. Really <laughs> I don't really have a process, man. Um, you know, it, it, I found for me, like a lot of the times, um, you know, I'll, I'll write a lot of songs at once. And then there'll be times where I really don't write anything for a while. Usually if I can get one song kind of like, you know, just wrote, not really having thought about it too much, it kind of sets like an easy precedent for me. That I think, um, you know, like it, it just opens up that, um, that mindset to, to write more. And that's, that's how it was always with Blitzkid. Uh, going back to Blitzkid, the way that we wrote um, in that band was, um, you know, I would just sit home and, and play guitar and I'd come up with the riff. And in the beginning I wasn't singing. Uh, you know, I was just playing bass. I'd never sang before. I didn't really have any intentions of singing. So I would come up with guitar riffs and um, I would call Tracy up and say, hey, I have a song. And, you know, he was way more experienced than me at the time when I joined Blitz Kid because he'd been playing in a lot of bands since he was like 13, 14 years old. And I didn't start playing, um, you know, any instruments till I was about 17, 18. Uh, mm-hmm. So right before when I joined Blitz Kid and I didn't really have any reason to to really buckle down with it um, until, you know, Blitz Kid came about. So uh, as far as the songwriting process with that goes, I would call him up and say, I have a song and I would go show it to him. And it just got to the point where we had a lot of songs between he and I. Um, and I learned a lot of songwriting just from the way that Tracy would kind of develop songs from Blitz Kid and, and bands that he was in before that. So that was kind of my model on top of other stuff that I liked. You know, I was listening to obviously a lot of Ramones, uh, Bad Religion, um, The Clash, stuff like that. Those were like my big bands kind of when I first started writing music and they're still important to me. But uh, it got to the point where there were just so many songs and the way that I wanted them to be sung, it was kind of taxing for, for Tracy because I was like, Oh, let's scream this one. This song, the Hills have eyes. Let, let's yell that. So 
he would say to me like listen after like 13 songs at a rehearsal like i can't do this like it, my voice isn't really you know what it should be so why don't you sing it and then it was just me screaming my way through you know whatever i wrote until the point that i guess i basically kind of learned how to sing and then once that happened i started writing more because i kind of understood um you know what i could do you know what i mean like well even though it's not much at the time or it's debatable that it is now but at that present moment i was just um it gave me a little more like i guess incentive to to to, to work and the process from that point in Blitzkid was just he and I getting together. And a lot of our songs, like even though like I may sing one or, or Tracy would sing one, we both always wrote those songs together. Like every song that is Blitzkid has a contribution from one or the other into it. Um, <clears throat> so going into Roby Midnight, after that, it was a lot different for me because I was used to really just writing songs with someone else. Um, but I had a lot of songs that really didn't fit into Blitzkid at the very beginning. And that's how the whole band came about. It wasn't even supposed to be a live band. It was just going to be a couple of records that I put out with songs that really didn't fit into Blitzkid during the time. So from that entire, you know, 20 years that we've been doing things, as I said, there were bands like The Clash that I liked. And there's an album called Combat Rock that for me is probably the most, um, I don't want to say like inspirational album in terms of punk rock because it really showed me that to be in a punk band you could do so much more um than just play three chords and that's fine you know what i mean and and i still do that and i love it but um it just didn't really work so much in blitz kid we had some songs like as the rope bridge sways um love like blood the intro of that used the whole song used to be like that actually um it just didn't work but by the roving midnight time when that started coming around it just, I had all these fractional songs. Um, so a lot of that was just kind of left over in a way, uh, the first two EPs, but by the time Dark and Your Doorstep came along, those were just new songs, more or less. Um, and to give you a simple answer to this long-winded one I've already given you, man, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> No, speak, movie, speak. You're like, speak. Oh, boy. <laughs> speak. I, you're going you're gonna to have to like narrow down your questions, man, because like, I'm just like, all <laughs> over the place. Favorite um, call. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, the Roby Midnight stuff was, well, the, the Dark and Your Doorstep stuff, uh, that usually starts with just a riff, man. I To, to, to keep it simple, I, I usually will come up with a riff, and then I'll try to run it through the Rolodex of all the riffs that I've written, and I'm like, does it sound like this one? Yeah. Is it that one? Because I don't know about you guys, but there have been so many times where I've written a song, and I'm so excited about it, and then a couple of days later, I realize, I'm like, this is the exact same song that's on an album I wrote three albums back. Yeah, I'm no for myself. No problem, buddy. We did that for 20 years. That's how we got here. Yeah. 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 That's all they do. Yeah. So that that's it, man. You know, I just I just try not to, to rip myself off as much as possible. Um and you know it's it's hard because I don't even know if this is like a, a an age thing, but you know, at a certain point you kind of, I don't think you intentionally stop discovering stuff, but you like what you like. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's, it, I like the bands that I liked when I was 21 years old and I still love those bands. Um, and there's so many good bands out right now, man, that are, that are, that are new that like I'll find out by out about by accident, either through Spotify or Pandora. And I'm like, this is really good. And it's, some of it's not even punk rock. Like I'll be on in the car and I'll listen to Sirius XMU, which is kind of like the hipster station. And there's stuff on there like, um, uh, Tame and Paula's and and oh, like yeah. times where I okay. listen to it and I'm like, this is really cool. Like I don't necessarily know that like I want to write that, but um, you know I, I I try not to like limit myself. I guess especially writing new music, I try to keep it open um, as I always have. And I guess that's the big takeaway from it is I don't I don't try to write a kind of song. It's like whatever is around me like, at the time when I'm writing, I just try to be open. You know what I mean. Yeah. So speaking Riding of, the vibe. Riding the vibe. So speaking of the uh, songwriting, tell us about, I saw uh, that post about you doing the soundtrack for uh, the score for Nosferatu. Uh, yeah, yeah. So that's the first, I mean, that was way out of the box for me uh, because, you know, it's, there's no, it's not a rock album. It's, it's just atmosphere. You know? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's more or less like it's already written and it already has its own, feeling and own theme and own vibe that's kind of universally recognized so um you know so the pressure I, had to be on though you had to 
the pressure was on because it's an iconic classic film that you're trying to match with the music to it. It's like, Wait oh a second. God. Are you wearing a Nosferatu shirt? Kind yeah, of. What's your shirt? <laughs> how, did you not, how did you not psych yourself out for that how did how did you like um I, i'll be honest with you like it, it hit me after i wrote everything so like when i was writing it i wasn't thinking about any of that because i was just excited to do it and i honestly it was just pure happenstance that the pressure didn't occur to me until after i wrote everything now it was prior to going in the studio which is its own pressure you know in itself but um the writing process, thankfully, I got all that out of the way. And when I was done with it, I looked at it and I was just like, holy shit. Like, I just really set myself up to either write something good. Um, but with something like Nosferatu, you don't want it to be good. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a classic. And, you know, like I, I realized I stood a very, you know, large chance of ruining one of the best movies ever, ever made with, with music that, you know, I just assume is good for it, but it really wasn't my idea. That's the thing. And I think that's what helped was I didn't go into it with like a preconception of like, this is how I'm attached to this movie. Um, what it was, was uh, my friend Cortland, who he runs a place called the Witch's Dungeon up here in Connecticut. Um, just to give you a really quick backstory on that. It's the longest running um, museum of its kind. It's been around since 1966. Uh, he is the So what you steal from it? Huh? <laughs> So what did you steal from it while you're there at night? Yeah. Uh, dude, it's, it's, yeah. If you guys saw this place, it's amazing. But his uncle. Oh, yeah. was, I, was actually this... well, I was going to say, I think I saw a, a documentary about that place. So when I saw your post about that, uh, that you're working there or yeah. working with them, it was just like, oh my God, that's amazing. So it's lucky. crazy. It, it, it's really crazy. So when I moved up here, uh, I'm going to try to stay on track here. But when I moved up here uh, into Connecticut about five years ago, um, you know, I had some friends who, well, they don't live here anymore and they didn't live here at the time, but you know, they, they had lived here at one point. So they said to me, well, listen, if you're where you're at geographically in Connecticut, which isn't that big, you could kick a soccer ball across this entire state, really, man. You know what I mean? It's like not big at all. They were like, there's this place called the witch's dungeon. And I had heard about it. Um, just, you know, being like a, a fan of horror movies and, and horror culture and things like that. Um, and Cortland had actually been at a few conventions that I was, you know, I was at that I didn't you know, know at the time he was there. Um, but what it is, is like he does, it used to be every Halloween, he would open up. He had this little thing in his backyard that his uh, dad had built. He opened it when he was 13 years old and he started sculpting these figures and they were pretty crude at the beginning because he's a kid. But as he went along at the time, no one else was doing this sort of thing. And he's like writing Forrest J. Ackerman. He's writing John Chambers. He's writing like, um, you know, uh, Vincent Price and all these people. And, and they're, Kind of like encouraging him. Uh, so John Chambers and Dick Smith, who, you know, he did The Exorcist. He also did all the makeup on Dark Shadows. Between he and uh, John Chambers, they kind of took Cortland under their wing and taught him a lot of the makeup techniques. And he got a lot better as he grew up and started kind of um, refabbing all of his figures. Um, and it built up traction. I mean, he like when he was like 24, 25 years old, he, he was in they had ads in National Geographic and Playboy, all these random things, because it was such a unique attraction to, to see anything like that at the time. Um, so, you know, he'd just been doing this for years and years and years. And when I came up here, I met him. Um, I started hanging out up there. He would show movies, uh, you know, in the off season. And it just kind of became one of those things where, um, you know, you know, you, you, you know, your own, you know what I mean? Like, like if we saw each other on the street, we would realize we probably have something in common. Right. I mean, <laughs> You know what I mean? Like, oh, uh, exactly. But no, it was his idea. Uh, long story short, it was his idea. He he had, he had approached me one night um, after we were watching uh, a movie or something that he was showing, and <clears throat> he shows everything on sixteen millimeter. And he told me he's like, I have a print of Nosferatu, um, and he knew that I'd been there. He knew I'd went to the castle where they filmed Nosferatu in, uh, in Slovakia, and I showed him the pictures, and he was like you're probably a good candidate for this because I know you're a musician and I know you're into this movie. I have a print because this is a first generation print. This came from the Museum of Modern Art, which came directly from the Cinematheque Francois in France, which was one of the only places that was able to necessarily like smuggle that movie out after Florence uh, Stoker had, you know, put a lawsuit on the Prana Film Company, which is who filmed Nosferatu. So 
that's how all prints of, of Nosferatu got to the States was through um, the Cinematheque Francois and ended up in Museum of Modern Art in 1929. But due to a lot of just incongruencies, they, they didn't copyright it. So it's, it's copyrighted in Germany. It's copyrighted in other parts of Europe, but not in America. So doing what I'm doing, uh, there's no restrictions on it. But he had this print that no one had ever seen before. I mean, it's the same footage, but it's not, you know, if you go on YouTube and you see the, the, that print, it's all from like this one same print. This is a different one, but it had no music. And the original score for that was written by a guy named Heinrich Marschner, and it's lost too, like the movie. I mean, the, everything about that movie was just destined to be lost for some reason. And um, so there's no music. And it's left kind of it open for anyone here in America, at least, to, to, to score it, to do whatever they want to it. Uh, typo, I think, did a score to it. Um, and there's no, no shortage of it, man. If you, It's not original music. I think someone had um, hodgepodge all their stuff together to fit into okay. the movie. Uh, but Fun. I think it was something that they actually like, um, I don't say licensed, but, you know, uh, backed and were like promoting. But I mean, you know, you have all kinds of if you go on Spotify right now, there's no shortage of scores for that movie. But this one particular print, he wanted to show it because that's primarily what he does. He shows all of these old movies. But when you show an old movie with no music and it's a silent movie, it's really hard to watch. So his whole premise was if you put music to this then this is something like I can show on a regular basis and it'll be a little more entertaining for people. And I was like, yeah, it's great. So I came home and I just sat down and I just started writing stuff, man. And I started writing it through the process of uh, just literally writing it out. I would watch the movie and then I would write what was happening and I would kind of write the mood. And by the time I was done, I had a whole story. And then I just kind of took that story and I broke it up into, you know, moods like, well, this is the first song. This is the second song, the third song. And then I just tried to write that way. Um, and I didn't really know what I was doing, you know, like, and, you know, it may have worked and it may not. I guess it depends on who you ask, who, who, who's listened to it. But um, oh, it's cool. It's I appreciate cool. that, man. Thank you. It was a lot of fun, man. I, you know, when it was all said and done and I got it, I was like, well, that actually worked. <laughs> like, I, <can't> <laughs> I was really well, surprised. You are essentially the embodiment of Nosferatu. So why wouldn't it work? You know? <laughs> ah! Oh, speaking of, speaking of Nosferatu. So you are a plethora of knowledge. Uh, thought, thoughts on the classic story of like, was it Max Shrek? Who like, mm -hmm. he just, notoriously just disappeared and people think he was actually a vampire because well, those were actually his real hands for some reason or no so there's a lot of misconceptions around this is gonna get really boring really quick for a lot of people I no 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 <laughs> bring it on baby you, I, just I, open, you just open the floodgates my friend so you yeah. guys are just gonna just give me no, one of these when it's time to stop you guys are gonna cut all this out anyway you're like no <laughs> <laughs> no 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 man yes so max Shrek. i'm very interested in that so Max Shrek, so originally Conrad Veidt was the, the actor that they chose for Nosferatu. Uh, Conrad Veidt being the uh, sleepwalker, Cesare in the cabinet of Dr. Caligari. Conrad Veidt was, a, I mean, a renowned star in Germany at the time that Nosferatu was filmed. And he and F.W. Murnau, who was the director of Nosferatu, they had already filmed a movie together prior to Nosferatu, which was a loose adaptation of uh, Robert Louis Stevenson's Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Uh, it was called Der Janiskopf which was Bell, one of Bela Lugosi's first uh, roles in, in a film, like a feature film. He played the butler. But just like Nosferatu, that whole movie was lost. And the screenwriter for that was Henrik Galeen, who was the screenwriter for Nosferatu. So they more or less got the whole crew together. And Conrad Veidt was um, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde in this original film. So it was like, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Let's do that. And they didn't get sued by Louis Stevenson's family. So they were like, Stoker's not going to know what we're doing at all. He's not going to know shit. So... They started writing this movie and um, what happened for whatever reason, Conrad Veidt, I think was like uh, stuck doing the Thief of Baghdad at that time uh, and he wasn't able to do it. And F.W. Murnau was actually going to postpone production in order to get Conrad Veidt, but Veidt turned it down. And for whatever reason, they never worked together again after that. But it was um, Alvin Grau, who was the, um, the art production guy. And he was actually like, really the impetus behind that whole movie even being a thing. He knew a guy down in Munich who was in a stage play of Moliere's uh, The Miser. And um, 
what it was was he played a guy named Klink, and Klink is the son of a guy named Harpignon in that play. And at that time, Harpignon was being played by Max Schreck. So he's like, look, I think I got a guy. So they were like, go down and check it out and see what he has to say about it. So Alvin Grau went down to uh, Munich and he visited Max Schreck. And uh, Schreck was into the idea. But th the thing about Schreck is, going back to the misconception that you had, is he wasn't an unknown guy. You have to keep in mind that this is 1921, 1922. This is at a time when film is new. It's a new medium. A lot of people, especially stage guys like Shrek, who's in his 40s at that point in time, early 40s, they've been doing this since they were 19 years old. And they had, they were becoming actors during a time when like they were treated like, like just scum of the earth if you were an actor, right? So they, they endured a lot of bullshit, kind of like us in a punk band. You know, you endure a lot of bullshit to get to do what you want to do because <laughs> you love it. And then a new medium comes along and says, oh, that's not what you do anymore. You're like, fuck you, this is what I do. So Shrek was of that, of that crew. He didn't do a lot of movies. He was skeptical of them. Um, but he also really understood like uh, the use of them too. So he was into the idea, man. He was into the idea, and he agreed that he would do it as long as they filmed during the off season of the theater months, which is why they had to wait till the next year to film it. So they started filming in July of 1921, and that's when Shrek came up. Uh, and they started filming in uh, Vismar, and that's kind of like a port city in the opening scenes. Um, but to kind of get back on track, so I, I told you this would happen. I'm sorry. Um, no, no, you are no Shrata. You have the knowledge. Gee, <laughs> that's. But the whole thing with that is um, with, with Shrek being the vampire. Um, yes. <clears throat> there was, they invited um, press into uh, the, the Jofa Studios in Berlin during the very last leg of the filming. And uh, there was a guy named Ari Karoy, I think his name was. He was a Greek um, 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 like reporter, like he was a, a, like a journalist. And then what had happened was Shrek was there and they were doing his scenes and it was a scene where he's coming out of the coffin in the ship and um, which interestingly enough was done on a set and if you look like in the scene where they're loading the coffins you see the the, the mask blowing it's in an old airplane hangar from World War One, and it basically had been de, de like commissioned and turned into a, a studio but they had a propeller plane on right outside of the of the thing blowing it to make it look like the, the wind was blowing the mask um, but he made a comment, something of the effect that under such makeup, anyone could be playing uh, this vampire. You know what I mean? And that kind of turned into a legend of this guy is a vampire, coupled with the fact that he had done really nothing prior to, the, to this at that level in a movie. And he only did one other film loosely connected to the horror genre um, a few years later with uh, Paul Wegner, who was the Gollum, who was... That's another big expressionistic film of you know the early 20s in Germany. And um, <clears throat> it was called The Curious Case of Dr. Ramper. And uh, it's like this weird animal kind of beast man. But that's the only thing he did besides that. And he, he just kind of laid low. So everyone just built up this thing around him that he was a vampire. And he, he created that makeup, man. That's the thing. Originally, it had hair. He had, it was supposed to have like a skull like Nosferatu was supposed to have this weird skull, which who knows, man. Um, but when Alvin Grau was there, there in Munich in that initial um, meeting, he just went to the production uh, room of the Munich theater there and was like, well, here's this, you know, rifleman's coat. He put that on. Uh, he had the idea for the bald cap. He patted his shoulders up really, really high. So he looked like he had uh, 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 um, the teeth were sculpted wood. Um, he just used mortician's wax more or less to, you know, build up the nose that he had here. And if you notice, and you'll see it only in a few scenes, he has these tufts of hair right here. And the reason why it is, was they used that to cover up the seam in the bald cap. Um, uh. but the grease makeup at that time, like, especially with Lon Chaney, man, it was really easy to get away with, you know, you just slather the shit on. And if you had the right lighting and you had somebody who knew what they were doing with lighting, then, you know, you could get away with anything makeup wise. And. Yeah. That was what made him really effective as a vampire. He really played that part, man. You know. So essentially, what you Wake said. Up, Bobby. Is, yeah, everybody, about lean the, forward. No, we're talking about the Shrek. We're gonna have, we're gonna have, we're gonna have a test on this. <laughs> well, you know, it, right? you know the um. Yeah. So what it sounds like is, 
the press came when he was doing some real vampire shit. You doing a beard? Jenkins in. <laughs> um, so they, so the press came when he was, was like a super vampire, and he was just kind of like in his, in the in the vampire vibe, and they didn't really speak the same language. So they're like, this guy's a vampire, and they're like, we need to run a story. So yeah, he's a vampire. Also, there's a movie called Shadow of a Vampire, right? Which perpetuate per, with the word, perpetuate. Um, per, exactly that word. Um, that that whole myth, right? Yeah. Man. Well, and, you know, and, and that was <laughs> very fascinating, but we got more questions for you. We got fire round questions. Let's do some no. fire round. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah man. Jimmy has prepared a bunch of for you. Absolutely. Is it true? Is it true that you have a master's degree in English? No, not English. I have I have a bachelor's degree in art and then and in history. So um, I had a double major when I was in college. I was going to get my master's, so I started the English Lit. That was so when I smart. started college. Um, but I Big started looking at more and more his, history electives because I really, really liked my professor at the time. And I really didn't like my English professor. Uh, so I just kind of started doing more and more history electives. And um, I just realized, I was like, I don't really know what I'm going to do with English Lit. So I think I'll probably, I think I'd rather be an unemployed history professor than an, an un, unemployed English professor. And that's kind of where I went, you know, but then there's, there's the art factor. And I went to a liberal arts college as well. So um, it was much more fun to be an art student at that time. I'm not antisocial, but I also realized like what part of the forest I'm from and where I don't belong. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that's a good one. Yeah, that's good. So, so, you know, it, it was a, and I went to a Baptist college, man, because I got a, I got a, a, a um, well, it was a scholarship for my first two years. I, I kind of laxed on, on, you know, the things that help you keep a scholarship. My grades were fine, but you know, I just, I wasn't scholastically, um, inclined anymore in terms of the college to keep giving me a uh, reason to go there on their on their benefit um <clears throat> but i switched it over to art it was just way easier there were only two other art majors uh we were in um the basement of the girls dorm and it was just we did whatever we wanted man i came to school in like kilts i you know we would sit there and blast um you know like uk subs and corrupted ideals and just like sculpt and paint it was just a lot of fun but I was going to go to art institutes originally out um, in San Luis Obispo, California. Um, but the whole thing with, with Blitzkid was kind of, uh, you know, I mean, this was 96, so it was kind of pre Blitzkid, but I knew that I wanted to do something musically. And, um, yeah, I just kind of hung around because I felt like I needed to be um, where I was. And, you know, Blitzkid didn't come around for another year or so, but I, it, it worked out. You know what I mean? It worked out. So. I yes. substitute teach sometimes. I don't do it anymore, but there was a point in time where I was I was able to substitute teach in, in Virginia when I, li I lived in West Virginia. Um, Did um, any students uh, recognize, hey, that's Bullsby. Yeah, yeah, dude. It was yeah. because, like, here's the thing. I realized that, like, all the kids who, all the assholes, like, all the kids like myself in, in, uh, in college, like, in high school who, you know, when the substitute would come in, you're like, all right, you know. We're going to make them work for it. You know, we're going to make them work for this. All those kids were like Blitz Kid fans, man. So like all the bad kids liked Blitz Kid. So if there were any other cut-ups in the class, you know what I mean? Like Johnny Football guy over here is like, hey, yo, I've been an asshole. Like the kid in the back, you know what I mean? Like the the, the deke from, you know, like Saved by the Bell, right? Like he's back there like, shut the fuck up. And like Mr. Goolsby's talking right now. And I'm like, yeah, you know, right, right. <laughs> So I had like yeah. my, I had my Here's own, an like, apple, like, Mr. Goolsby. Yeah, I had like my own my own strong. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> All um, right, so you're multi-talented. Right. You're also a tattoo artist, correct? Educated, incredible. Big brain. <laughs> that is correct, yes, sir. I, yeah, I, I'm, so Black Hydra. You, you currently work there? You got a stall at Black Hydra? I do, yes. Black Hydra is a new establishment in Fitchburg, um, Massachusetts that I, I have a, a <clears throat> excuse me, like a residency. Uh, booth at so, so I'm how licensed. many kid tattoos have you given people for free <laughs> <laughs> have, you done any, have you done any have you done uh if somebody, if somebody oh. came in and said give me a Brit blitz kid tattoo a ghoul i tattoo. would give him a calibri's tattoo instead yes because <laughs> <laughs> you know what the customer really wants <laughs> i would be like i would be like this is what you need that might be what you want is a blitz kit tattoo, but what you need is a calories tattoo. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
you know, man, I've, done a, I've done a few, you know, like the whole tattooing thing started when I was in college again, like when I was in, that was, that became my major and my last semester I had just, it was a, it was a thesis class. I just had to write on something and I was like, well, I want to go into tattooing. Um, I don't need to go to college for tattooing, but I'm probably highly more likely to get a job at a tattoo shop reputably if I have a college degree. And one of my focuses was writing a thesis paper specifically on the history of tattooing, which I did. And, um, you know, I took it into this tattoo shop in Roanoke, Virginia, which was like a couple hours from where I lived. Um, they were like, OK, you can be an apprentice. And I apprenticed at this place for a good you know, like year and a half, I think it was. And um, <clears throat> towards the end of it, you know, they were like, OK, look, you're kind of rounding the end of this. Um, you know, we still need somebody to go buy our cigarettes and make sure people don't get towed out of the parking lot. But you might get to start tattooing sometime soon. And um, they told me they were like, however, you're going to have to make a decision between, um, you know, tattooing and playing music. And we were like in pre-production for Let Flowers Die at that time. We were already like doing that. And originally I was even considering it. I was like, well, can I finish this album first? And they were like, no, because when you're gone, we have a chair open. And that means that, you know, we could have somebody here making money. And you just, that's, that's not what we do here. And they were really, really old school about shit, man, which I respect. Um, so that's, I, I, I stopped doing it. You know what I mean? I, I, I bowed out and... Um, it was fast forward up until I think like 2010, um, you know, I, a friend of mine who actually, I, he's like five or six younger, years younger than me. And um, when I met him, he was like, I was like, he was like 11 years old rollerblading. And like, I was like showing up with no shirt on with like a bandana, like skateboarding, you know, like bleeding and just like blasting social distortion out of my trunk. And he's like, whoa, man, can you teach me to skateboard? And I did, I taught him how to skateboard. And um, he ended up becoming like one of the best skaters, you know, in town. Like, it was crazy. But I meet him again, like he was gone for a couple of years. And lo and behold, I see him at Walmart in Bluefield, West Virginia, which is like, you know, the social media hub of, of, of my area. And he's like, yeah, I'm, I have a tattoo shop now. The, the owner that had the place that I worked at died. And, um, you know, I took it over because I really don't want to go back to Burger King. I was like, all right. I was like, he goes, didn't you used to tattoo? And I said, I did, but I never actually got started. He goes, well, come work for me. I need some people. So I, I worked there for about four and a half years till I moved to Connecticut. And then I took some time off because there's no shops really right here where I'm at. However, Brad from the band Damnation um, up in Massachusetts, they're only like two hours from here. Um, he told me they were going to be opening a shop soon. And he's like, look, I don't care if you're on tour. Like we have it set up to where like, you know, think of it as a show, um, you know, like the four of us, which are the main artists, um, that's the guarantee. You're just the merch money that comes in. You know what I mean? It's supplemental. It's not hurting us if you're not here. It helps, but it's not going to hurt us. So that's how I ended up there. All right, nice. All right, so <laughs> is there a story? Okay. So long live the whore. Was the story behind that? How'd you guys come up with that uh, that slogan? I don't think anybody's ever asked us that, man. Wow. Uh, oh. Good job. Good job. Hashtag long live the whore. He's like, we don't know that. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's going to be such a letdown to tell you that I really don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that was something um, that we just kind of came up with when we were uh, uh, like like signing stuff. I th you know what I mean? Like, not that we were really signing anything at the beginning of the days. So our first few shows was was we were playing an open mic night at a, at a at a bar that was upstairs from a Chinese restaurant, and uh, they didn't want us there. You know what I mean? That we we shut it down. They wouldn't let us in. We came in one night with our amps and they had this guy Malmo at the door like, nope, nope, nope. You guys have single-handedly ruined open mic night for everybody at Hamptons. You're too loud. Go home. So we were like, well, that was fun. I guess it was fun being in Blitz Kid. And I guess we'll go back to just playing nowhere. And then we got a call. We got a call from the guy. And it was the most reluctant call ever. He was just like, all right. So there are people who really want to see your band. So we'll let you guys play on a Saturday night when you can be loud. However, don't be that loud, please. Because it was like one of these like, you know, multi-family story houses all on this one street. And they were barely coded to even be like a bar slash restaurant to begin with. And you throw a bunch of idiots like us in the mix. And it's just like, it's you're asking to get shut down. So um, <clears throat> that's how we started playing. And I think the Long Live the Horror just came from that. We were like, you know, like, here we are, Long Live the Horror. And oh, I think that was more of, a, more of a Tracy thing. I think he came up with that. So it's... It's been a that's from the very beginning, son of a bitch. I thought it was just a fun hashtag. 
<laughs> no, no, that's that's as long as I can remember it, man. Um, wow. I, as long as I can remember. A yeah, Chinese could... restaurant, too. Only noodles, Goolsby. <laughs> <laughs> it was in a pink house. It was a pink house, man. <laughs> it was amazing. It, Dude, I, I, I think back how things are so different now. And you guys have been playing long enough to experience it as well. Like, you've probably noticed, like, a difference in the, ter- in, in the way that people, for lack of a better term, express themselves at shows. Um, you know, not that it's... You not mean that- sleep? <laughs> yeah, exactly right it's like Bunch of friends friends dead. Dead. <laughs> that's a good way to put it man when we started like at this place hamptons um like there was a staircase right at the edge of the stage so like we were in a cubby hole and the audience area was more or less just on a landing right around the staircase that went down to the chinese restaurant and it was like 15 steps and i can't tell you how many people fell down those steps when we were playing man i'm, I'm dead serious and we would do some crazy shit we would we got into a habit where we were, um, and you can see it on our old flyers. Like I have a bunch of our old flyers. We were doing contests and we, we would just make them up as we went. Like we found a dead bird outside one time and put it in a bag and said like, whoever, you know, we did a raffle for the, for the, for the bag. We made like $35. And so I got a dead bird and they were so excited that they had a dead bird. And they were like, yeah, dead bird, blitz kid, sign this bird. It, it was just, it was That's a different marketing. time. It, it, was, it was a different time, man. Dead bird. Yes. Yes. Scoring. It was just the, the Shrek. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Shrek. Shrek five. Shrek five. Uh, <laughs> nice. You got any more? I think. Oh, well, I have an ultimate question yeah. for you. Oh wait, 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 I got one more. Okay. One more. Yeah. What's okay? So it seems you post a lot about uh, Mothman. What's your What's mm, the deal? Cryptozoology. Yeah, what, what, man. You guys are really trying to turn this into a, a, a an all nighter, man. I'm so sorry. <laughs> all night with Goose. All, all, like... all night, all night, all, all night, night. Long. We need to do a cover of that together. Let's do Lionel Richie's All Night Long together. That'd be amazing. Well, I got a tambourine over here, so uh, <laughs> I got some stuff around. Like I, I got some books. <laughs> yes, I was just gonna say you could pound on a book. book. So, uh, what was the question? The Mothman. Mothman. Yeah, what's the fascination with that? Yeah, one? why are you sexually attracted to <laughs> Mothman? Why is that? Why the Mothman? Yeah. <laughs> Hashtag horny for Mothman. Um, <laughs> yes. So, so t-shirt uh, idea. Write it down, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have jack shit on here. Oh, oh uh, we got chupacabra. Sure. You, have, you have that. You also have the skinwalkers, kind of like around. Yeah. The that's kind of um, cool. I, you know, uh, you, you know, you. I mean, that's the great thing about the Southwest that I love is, um, you know, you have all the the the, the different plains, you know, in Southwest uh, Indian tribes, you know, down there, like uh, that, that have so many like really interesting uh, stories, man. Like we have, I mean, obviously, like we, you know, we have there, in North America, you know, broadly speaking, there's all kinds of indigenous tribes still to this day. But you know, and if you really dig for them, you can find a lot of really interesting um, things, like. On the East Coast, we have a lot of Cherokee. You know, my, my great, great, great grandmother was uh, Cherokee. And like, they had the thing called the Baycock. And the Baycock was more or less like this thing that would walk around. Uh, it was like a, kind of like a ghoul. And he would, while you were sleeping, he would find hunters. And um, he would take a stone knife and incise you and then take a little bit of your liver out and eat it. And then that would more or less curse you uh, to bring oh, that back to your tribe. And then that would more or less cause yeah. crops not to grow and everybody would die. But um that kind of leads into the mothman actually um a lot of people the the big tribes in 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 um at least where i'm at in southwestern virginia and west virginia you had the cree you had the shawnee and you had the cherokee and the thing about these indian tribes much like tribes being you know by definition is they don't really work well together you know what i mean like um they're rivals so to speak you know what i'm saying uh but the Shawnee in particular, um, they had a really bad time um, with, with uh, uh, I'm trying to think of how to like <laughs> put this in, in, in terms that's not going to turn into a big Dia tribe, but uh, all right, just, just follow me for a second. Okay. <laughs> in colonial Virginia, there was a guy named Lord Dunmore. Lord Dunmore was more or less sent by the crown to act as governor for that entire region. Okay. He was in charge of more or less expanding the crown expanding the dynasty of 
you know, uh, you know, Christian, whatever religion, English uh, background, all that stuff. What happened was the problem, and I say problem from their perspective was, well, how are we going to do that? We have all these tribes and the tribes were like, fuck you. You know what I mean? Like we're, you're not coming in here. Um, and they essentially had to band together at one point and all of them banded together uh, and they were fighting Lord Dunmore's war. And there's an area of Point Pleasant, West Virginia, which is where the Mothman's from, or, you know, or where it's been sighted most. I don't even want to say most recently because it's been popping up in Chicago over the past five years, pretty repetitively. But that's still kind of Ohio Valley, uh, Midwest area. Um, they all banded together to fight this war right on the Ohio River. Point Pleasant is situated right on the Ohio River in the bend between Point Pleasant and across the river is Gallipolis, Ohio. Um, the river was, you know, that's the main artery. That was the waterway. That's transaction. That's commerce. So it was very important to have these waterways. And this, there was a huge standoff, more or less, in this area. And um, they had a, a, a chief by the name of Cornstalk, who became the chief of the Federation. Now, he was putting up a really good fight, man. <clears throat> so they decided, okay, we're going to bring this guy in for a banner of truce. They brought him in. But what happened was, you guessed it. You know, it wasn't an ice cream party. He's like, it's like Spicoli. Like, there's no birthday party in here. It's like they kill the guy, right? They kill him. And before he dies, he goes, I put a curse on this land for 200 years. Now, I think this was 1775 or six. It was late 1770s. Um, and if you look at the, the, the course of events, the sequence of events for the Mothman, that all began in 65, 66, depending on who you ask. Um, and it kind of culminated there in, in Point Pleasant. So a lot of people feel like, to answer your question, one of the um, beliefs is that it's, uh, you know, uh, the result, it's a resultant of a, of a Native American curse on that land due to, you know, the interloping of Lord Dunmore and his, his band of, uh, you know, merry thieves. So that's one way to look at it. But, you know, it depends on your perspective on things. You know what I mean? Like, it, it, you know, I, I like history, so I, I consider that perspective. But some people, they're just like, they like UFOs. So you can apply really anything to it if you really want to. There's a lot of parallels that can lead you back to the Mothman. Um, you know, the whole UFO thing is people believe that it's an ultra terrestrial. And more or less with an ultra terrestrial, what that means is it's not extraterrestrial in the sense that it comes from a different place. It's here with us. It's just existing on a different plane. And if you can think of it in terms of the spectrum, the light spectrum, you have infrared and ultraviolet, right? You don't see those colors when you're looking directly ahead because they're on the periphery of your, your visual spectrum. However, that's like that whole theory when, oh, I saw something move out of the corner of my eye, but when I turn, it's gone. That's the whole pretense of ultra terrestrials. They exist here, but they're out of our spectrum. That's where the term spectrum comes from, any, or specter, because it's, you know, on the spectrum of these things. So you turn, it's gone. A lot of people believe that it's just something from a different world and no one knows why, man. It's just, it comes here for whatever it needs to come here for. You know, that really gets into a whole other level of, of study and, and even beliefs for that matter. I mean, multidimensional time traveling, things like that. And if you've seen the Mothman prophecies, which is, it's okay. It's, it's, it means well, the movie, but it's loosely, yeah, it's, it's based. <laughs> exactly. It doesn't get into the Mothman. The problem with that is it was written by a guy named John Keel, who was actually a, a cryptozoologist, but he was so much more. He was a journalist and he was actually, you know, a researcher for, uh, you know, trained researcher on a lot of different fields. But he was just so happy to be interested in, in everything that was happening with the Mothman because he saw it with his own eyes in terms of all the activity that was happening. It wasn't just the Mothman. During like 65 and 66, on into the late 70s, they had what's called in the UFO circles a flap. You know what I mean? Like there was every night lights in the sky shit happening, man. And people from all over, everywhere. I mean, New York, that's where John Keel, he was up in the Northeast. He was coming down to see these things and he was really like intrigued by it. Um, but his whole belief was, you know, out of that Mothman prophecies, that was all of his notes. And they kind of turned it into a shitty, you know, Hollywood, you know, glamorized movie. And they were also bringing in a lot of other stories of a guy named Injured Cold, uh, who was a time traveler. If That's the theory, who had nothing to do with the Mothman, but it was still kind of like happening uh, in parallel to the Mothman in Parkersburg, West Virginia. But long story short, I don't know, man. I mean, that's kind of my uh, fascination with it was, I mean, how can you not be fascinated with those things when you're a kid? Like, I didn't know those things when I was a kid, right? So it's like, I was already fascinated with the concept of it. And then when you start learning as you get older and, and, and as your interest develops, like all these other layers to the onion and it becomes so much more interesting, then suddenly it's plausible. It's not just like, oh, it's Bigfoot running through the woods, you know, so it's cool. It's like, there's 
a potential for like this thing to exist really, you know, in a way, um, you know, much like Santa Claus, I just choose to believe that he's there. You know what I mean? Hail like, Santa, dude. <laughs> Hail Peace. Santa. Hail Santa. So speaking of specters and, and things like that, we have a brand new tradition here on the Mr. Cult of Horrors Calvary's podcast. All right. Do you, our guy freaking Goolsby, <laughs> have a ghost story? Have you been attacked? <laughs> you need help. You need help. <laughs> uh, blink if you need help. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> okay, <so. laughs> um, yeah, man, like I said, I, I was going to say... <laughs> I, I was I was hoping to get invited back to this thing, but like after after today, man, you guys were like, we don't have enough time for that idiot. Like, it, it, no way. <laughs> That's why you have to come back. That's where I come yeah, back. Yeah, back and back and back. Well, you get toast. I, I, I like it. I like it, man. I, like, I, I'm looking. It's like I said. Like you know, I, I can be one too. Okay. <laughs> get it. There you go. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I love it. I always love that. Yeah, that's a good one. I like that one. Um, yeah, ghost stories, man. I I, I, I have a few, so it's kind of hard for me to. <clears throat> what's the most, what's the sexiest one? <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, you said, um, like you heard a noise. Someone said, Goolsby. And you said, shut up. And then they scratch you. And you're like, yeah. Fuck. <laughs> yeah. That, uh, Did that really happen? That's, yes, a, sexy, that happen? that's no. a sexy ghost story. Then you got like, oh, I, I saw. I looked up. It's the ghost comes in. Oh. Yeah. 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 Um, I, I do, man. I do. I don't. I unfortunately don't have a lot of sexy ghost stories. I only attract just like, you know, haggard, angry spirits. So like, I, I, I don't know, man. I'm, I'm trying to think. Like as a kid, um, you know, I used to experience like stuff like random, but nothing like really out of the realm of, you know, weirdness, so to say. Like you know, like for example, there was um, on the hillside across from my house in the holler that I live in. Uh, there was like an axe murder way back in the day, and the and the, the one of the kids survived. And he ended up becoming the old man that gave me Werther's originals when I mowed his grass. Um, but you know, he was one of the only survivors. But from time to time, it, you'd hear weird shit up on the hillside, like screaming. And I've told this story so many times. If anybody ever puts my podcast appearances together that, you know, it, where the topic of ghosts come up, this will come up again. But like Noah, you know, Shadow Wind Hawk was there. Uh, Jason Trioxin was there. Uh, my friend Willie was there. Our buddy Mark Pullen from Vegor was there. Like we were all stand side one night. Um, after a show, we were stopping, you know, we were in West Virginia, so we were staying at my old place. And, I mean, we all heard it up on the hill, but I don't want to spend too much time on that because it's not really that great of a story. Uh, my actual, <laughs> I guess, like, I'm, I'm trying to think of, I have, sounds... of I have had a lot so, of stuff happen. So basically, you're saying you heard a scary sound. Scream. And that's that. <laughs> uh, well, 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 screaming, like blood, like a like a woman, like a, like a, sh a scream. That's like a scary, form. dude. Yeah. Pretty good. Uh, and did you like you with all the dudes and you're like you hear that did you hear that no, no, yeah yeah so it was about 1 30 in the morning he was coming home late from a show and I, jason was actually outside smoking a cigarette in the street and he just goes and he threw a cigarette down and he just like he literally walked like this man like like you know like like the walk when you're like oh i might shit my pants like yeah he was <laughs> walking like that back to the board, kind of like i, I want to run but i don't want to run um but i had a lot of stuff happen mainly I've, I've had a lot of instances overseas, like in Germany, uh, in one town in particular, actually, I've had a number of um, like reoccurring haunts in one particular city in Germany. Uh, it's called Illingen and it's in Zarland, which is, you know, way down kind of on the, towards the, 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 the French border, the Swiss border. Um, you know, it's one of the states down there. But um, in Illingen, we used to play a little area there. Um, one of the youth centers called the Utes. And it's basically like what they do all across Germany um, is, you know, they'll take old decommissioned buildings, a lot of the time government buildings that they're not using anymore. And rather than demolish them, you know, they're more progressive about it. They give them to kids to more or less do like 924 Gilman or, you know, something like that with it and let them like run it and develop like their own kind of business practices. <clears throat> and um, this one particular place that we played uh, was an old jail. And so, you know, obviously there's going to be some shit uh, tied to that. 
but we were, you know, walking around before the show. And I remember being backstage and, you know, we were looking in the cells. And if you ever have a chance, watch an old movie called um, uh, Vampire by, uh, it's from 1932. It's from a Danish director named uh, Carl Theodore Dreyer. And it's kind of a silent movie. It's kind of not. And it, also it's rumored that Max Schreck is the voice of one of the characters in that movie, but it's unconfirmed. Um, <clears throat> but there's a scene where like the shadow gets up off of a bench and walks and climbs up a ladder. I saw the like, clear as day a shadow, like a person sitting and stand up, um, you know, and just walk to the window. And then it disappeared into uh, one of the, the shadows that was being cast off the window. <clears throat> and then that night, we were um, staying in, a, in an inn near the place, probably about like, I don't know, like m a mile away. And um, it was just someone's house, you know, like it's an old part of Germany. So it's like bed and breakfast style thing. And it was on a farm. And um, we were, our drummer at the time, Stripes, we were, we, we had a room together. And I remember we were watching TV and, you know, TV in Germany at like one in the morning in Zarlands, like you just watching shit, making your own entertainment. So we're just watching TV. And, um, before you know it, man, like the TV started kind of going to this weird herringbone pattern, started kind of going on the fritz and it smelled like it was catching on fire. It was, it was like a, an electrical smell. So we unplugged it and it was hot, man. It was really hot. So we're thinking like, ah, whatever, man, this is just like some old shitty wiring. And, um, we were laying down to go to sleep. And then the only thing I remember was, um, being woken up, like waking up and stripes being like, we got to go, we got to go. And, and more or less what had happened was he told me that, while we were laying there sleeping that I had gotten out of bed and I started crawling around the room on all fours, uh, like a spider. And I was trying to like climb around on stuff and I kept climbing on the bed and he was like, what are you fucking doing? Leave me alone. But I was completely somnambulistic. I was out of it. I was, and I don't remember any of that stuff and I believe him. So we go over to the next room where our tour manager's staying and she wants none of it. She's like, go to bed, you bunch of babies. Like who cares? You're a spider. Leave me alone. Like I got shit to do. I got to drive your I got to drive your stupid asses to wherever tomorrow, like go away. But she's already up at this point. So she's like, all right, whatever. And we're like, we're staying in this room, whether you like it or not. So she goes outside and she's smoking a cigarette and she comes back in and she's freaking out. And she's just like, I literally saw someone come out of the woods and throw a rock at me and then go back in. But they, there was no death form to them. So that night was spent more or less all of us like kind of huddled together. And I'm, I'm trying to tell it really fast because like so there's, there's other parts of this, but um, we went back a few years later with the Roving Midnight, and um, we were in the same town. This time it was at a different venue, but it was only like three blocks away from where we had played originally. And we were staying on a farm. Again, it was another farm. It was, uh, I want to say April, early May, so it was still kind of cold in that part of, of, of Europe. And um, I just remember where we were staying. It was a farm. It smelled like, you know, cow manure everywhere. It was typical that part of Germany. We check in. We go to the venue. Um, there are two like kind of buildings on this establishment is there's the house where the lady lives and she has an upstairs part where our tour manager and Loki from uh, you know, Loki from Daryl chemical company was staying. And then the other side was the in bed and breakfast where myself and the guys from creep keeper five were staying. Cause they were our backup band, including Loki. So we get back that night and I go into my room. I, I, I had my own room that night. I was just like, I've got sunglasses. I get my own room. Don't make me, don't, don't make me angry. Right. Like, you know, you get your own room. You know what you're talking about. <laughs> I'm kidding. But no, I, it just happened that way that I ended up in my own room by myself at the end of the, of the hallway. And I was like, cool, whatever, man, that's fine. So I go in and I, I, I was um, brushing my teeth, getting ready to, and below the mirror, there's like a glass you know, kind of free floating shelf. And it had the little glass tumbler on the doily, you know, your little shampoos right here. I was brushing my teeth. And I was like, I should probably reach for that glass now. And as I looked at it, it started like shaking a little bit, like just a little bit like this, like, like Jurassic Park, like that moment where I'm like <laughs> looking at it. And then it goes zip, right across the whole thing. And I go, I have a toothbrush in my mouth. I was just like, so I was like, Pff. and I just reached down to the faucet and I was like rinsing my mouth out. And I was like, I'm out of here. And as I left the shower, it was one of those like uh, sliding uh, collapsible three section doors where it opens, it opens and it opens again. Start banging, and banging, and banging on it. And I was like, fuck this dude. So I got in bed and I turned on the TV and it was family guy. And I was like, I'm watching family guy in German. I cranked it as high as I could. And I was yeah. watching TV. And I was like, I'm going to sleep. I'm not going to bother anybody. It's fine. And I was just telling, I was like, Hey, I'm just here. I'm sorry. Stupid American. I don't even want to be here, but I can't figure out how to go anywhere else on my own right now. 
I'll leave tomorrow. Just please let me go to sleep. And then I fell asleep. I don't know how long I'd been asleep, but it was one of those dreams where you feel like you're, you know, you're choking, you can't breathe. And I needed to wake up, but I couldn't. And then I saw in my dream, like I was laying down looking up this precipice. And then over the precipice came this face looking over like this. And it was totally, <laughs> it was totally like, you know, grudge moment, right? And it was, it was a girl and, uh, uh, and, and she fell, she fell, dude. I was watching this person fall and I'm like freaking out in my mind, like, oh my God, she's going to die. And I'm watching her fall. And then suddenly it occurs to me like she's going to hit me. And then it kind of, she, she's turning in the air on slow-mo all dreamlike. And then I see her face and it's getting closer and closer. And it's just what you would expect, man. Just completely devoid. Like it was just gone. And then when the impact hit me, that's when I more or less woke up, but I couldn't move. I was paralyzed. So I finally wrestled myself into, you know, being mobile. I was, dude, I was in boxer shorts, man. I had nothing else on. I grabbed the room key and I ran out of that, that room as fast as I could. I ran down the hallway. I went outside and I started banging on the next room because I was like, I want the key to the van. I'm sleeping in the van tonight. I'm, I'm not going in there. But no one's answering, right? I'm like, damn it, man. So I go back over to the, the, the building that I was in. Got my key. Doesn't fucking work, man. And I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. It, it's like 40 degrees. I'm in my boxer shorts. And it's like like 3 30 in the morning at this point, for all I know, just based upon like I'm like, well, it looks like it's 3 30 in the morning. I'm gonna be out here all night. And I start throwing rocks at windows that I think the Crypt Keeper Fiber in, hoping to God I don't wake up random people stay in there. I was out there for a long, long time, man. Like, to the point where I was like, I think I'm gonna dye my underwear in Germany. <laughs> I was like, they're gonna oh, find me in the morning, like it died like, like a rock. Oh, like yeah. a shiny, they're gonna find me the next morning, just like, you know. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and and finally, Johnny comes through the window. He's like, "What are you doing?" I'm like, "Let me in." So I come inside, and we're standing in the stairway, and I'm telling everybody what happened. And they're just a bunch of Jersey ballbusters, right? So Dave, who is like King Ballbuster of the group, standing there, he's like, "Yeah, ghouls, I think you're full of shit. I think you're full of shit. You and your ghost stories. Go back to bed." And while he's saying that, the light bulb, and they they were all there for this. The light bulb on the wall goes. Kablooey blows up, dude. Oh my God. <laughs> and everybody silently looked at one another and went back to the rooms. And every and, and Johnny saw me and he's like, Johnny's such a sweetheart. He's just like, you can come in here, cool speed. So I went in there and I slept on the floor the rest of the night, man. And the next morning we I asked the lady, you know, that everyone's down at breakfast, sorry, laughing their asses off. Loki and, and and the guy Zed, who was our tour manager, because they were all kind of telling the story. And uh they're like, there he is. There. And I'm like, hey, what's going on, man? And she's like, why don't you just use your key? And I'm like, it didn't work. And she's like, well, I need it back anyway. So what do you mean it doesn't work? And she goes over and it worked. Uh, so that's, ghost. That's, uh, <laughs> that's my time. But no, I mean, that's, and I had another thing happen there in that town. But again, we'll, we'll that's, we'll, that's for now. well, now you said I don't have a sexy ghost story. That's. That yeah, is wow. a sexy ghost story. Cool. Like, run around his body. <laughs> yeah. Well, like, uh, well, I just meant like, I just meant like she wasn't like, you know, like the girl ghost wasn't like in like, you know, like a go go dancer outfit. Oh, <laughs> oh it's sexy yeah. ghost. Story. That's well, uh, okay. So we're at the top of the podcast. We're at the very end, but you know what? It is. We got a party bonus game. round. We got. We got a partying gift for you. Get it? Get it? <laughs> That's right. Oh, this is a brand new Calvary shirt. At this moment, it might be sold out. Dude, let me see it again. Sport. I love that. That's an awesome design. That's well, you know cool. what? Well, if it's available, CalvarySTore.com. But for you, for all the other fools, but you, my friend, this is on the house. This is for you. Nice. Well, I... I Dude, that's awesome. Thank you very much, man. So I'll get your info after this, and then we'll send it over. I will wear it. I, I will... Okay, so thank you so much for your time and coming on the show, telling all your stories. It's so great. I can see why you you uh, could hold the class, and uh, you know it's just amazing that that you have such a great memory and such great stories. So thank you so Big much. Big brain. For sharing. brain I, I, thank you, seriously, and I, I really it, when I, I know I have a tendency to, to do this and, and especially on topics that I like. So I really hope that I didn't bore the shit out of you guys or like just oh. try to like talk about, 
I know I'm your guest and it's like, we're going to talk about shit, but like, I want you to know, like, I'm just as interested in what you guys are doing too, even though I'm not asking the questions. Like, I'm, I'm you are our guest. Yeah, we didn't invite you on so we could talk about ourselves. Yeah, and it's all you, baby. And to be, and, and, and to be honest, um, you, you never had you. <laughs> well, there's actually, I know there's another uh, wormhole or a worm, can of worms we can open up. Yeah. A different time, I'll just do a cliffhanger. What we do in the shadows. Oh You're a fan? That's right. You are. I knew it. <laughs> I knew it. Dark in your doorstep. I know you got that from that. Actually, I got that from TV's dad. He used to say, like, here comes here. he goes, he goes, Oh, here comes them boys over here to, to rehearse dark and because we rehearsed at Tracy's mom's house. Because his dad lived, you know, in one part of the, and his mom. And we'd be over there. And I remember one time we, we were rehearsing, he'd be like, Oh. That's just my son and his band darkening the door, like darkening our doorstep. We have a song called Invasion of the Door Now Dead in Blitz Kid. And he, and that was a term that his dad would use too. He's like, that's deader than a door now. So we were like, door now dead. Oh. So that actually came from his, from his dad. That, that, that's, that, that's one of those. So does TV's dad get songwriting credits? <laughs> yes. All royalties coming at you. <laughs> Dollar dollar bills, y'all. He's gonna, he's gonna he's gonna get paid in Blitzkid merch. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's paid in merch, yeah. So uh, yes. Any parting thoughts? No, he's getting well, paid we, in oh, oh my god, we didn't like we didn't like oh, yeah. to plug. Plug some shit, dog. Yeah, all right. Shit, Where that? can everybody, all hundred million people listening and watching, find <laughs> Argyle Goolsby? Where can they support you? You so, have the floor. You just got to go to calibriesrock.com and look for the picture of the guy doing this. Yes, good one. That's me. That's me. I'm, I'm Stevie Calabrese. That's right. uh, no, uh, so, so there's a couple of uh, places you can find us. Uh, the main hub for all of the bands, which is Blitzkid, uh, myself, and then the projects Roving Midnight and uh, the Hollow Bodies, is uh, A Corpse With No Name Productions. That's kind of the umbrella um, thing that I do. And that is A-C-W-N-N-P-R-O-D dot com because it's a lot shorter and easier than a corpse with no name productions dot com like i made that mistake <laughs> early on um and then aside from that our store you know we have um acwnn store dot com uh and then i would suggest people to check out i mean on on instagram facebook just look up argyle Goolsby or blitz kid but i also just want to uh, recommend people to check out the witch's dungeon that's the place i was mentioning at the top of the show that i'm working um, they do a lot of incredible stuff there. A lot of uh, original movie props, a lot of original um, like sculptures and, and things that you won't find anywhere else at all. I mean, they have the prototype for the creature from the uh, Black Lagoon like head there before it even had the gills. Like crazy, crazy stuff there. So check that out. It's uh, preservehollywood.org. And then on Instagram, it's uh, The Witch's Dungeon. So there you go. And that's it. That's yeah. it. <laughs> oh, oh, and Black Hydra. Black Hydra, uh, blackhydratattoo.com or Black Hydra Tattoo on Instagram. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was just going to say, Argyle Goolsby, OnlyFans, Dash. I go to the, um, I work at the, work at the Witch's Dungeon too. But that's only on weekends. Um, hey man, you got to do what you got to do. What's a BDS? Uh, uh, Bob DSM, what is that even? Yeah, it's Bob DSM. Bob DSM. Bob DSM. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, oh, Steve, Steve. Uh, Bob, this is Mary. His real name is Mary. <laughs> oh, that's it, man. That's it, dude. Hey, hey I want to come back and talk about comic books because I love oh, wow. oh, yeah. Oh, the worms. Oh, the oh, can yeah. of worms, dude. Oh, the cameras. What do you got? Oh, my God. Do you got the Beware All Vampire? Virginia. When I was getting my coffins, I found my Count Duckula collection. Duckula, dude. Issue number okay, three. right there. I'm going to flash a comic book. No one go anywhere. Who's Duckula? <laughs> you, right. got, you got Duckula in our possession. We got Bruce Lee, baby. <laughs> Dude, that's awesome. <laughs> what a With a fun oh my God, Mortal Kombat ad on the back. I remember those, man. I, you know what? I, I, found, I, I found the Predator versus Batman comic when I was home, too. When the Predator was versus Batman. <laughs> I was oh. like, oh, my God. I forgot this existed. So versus you, Batman? Yeah, you never saw that? It was DC. It was Predator versus uh, Batman. Look Son of a bitch. It's awesome. It's awesome. That does sound awesome. 
<laughs> okay. Right. Well, mm-hmm. I guess that's it. You got next scenario coming up. Thank, here, so. thank you. Well, let's wrap it up. Okay, let's wrap it up. Oh my God, we're gonna round it up. No, we have it over. Here we go. No. Okay. So thanks for everyone watching and listening. We had a special guest, a very, very special guest. This is what we like to call vampires on vampires with <laughs> with our council <laughs> seat. <laughs> Interviewed, but you get the idea. Interview of a vampire, vampire. But yes, thank you, Goldby. You've been a thank you pleasure. For and... your vampire party, I, I appreciate it. I had a lot yeah. of time. That, that is cool. I, I did like the explanation of Mothman and how he's. Mm. Uh, yeah, I just thought it was a big fat moth. Yeah, yeah. 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 That well, another yeah. statue perpetrating lives. <laughs> well, it, it, it only got the, the the title the Mothman. Uh, I mean, if you got a minute to tell you, it only got that because again, the press they picked it up. The AP uh, got the wire for it and. There was actually at that time um, a character uh, in, in the Batman series, like in the 60s, that was being developed. I'm not even sure if he was or was not actually seen on the Adam West series of Batman, but they were calling him the Mothman. And that's uh, where that came from was because they were like, wait a minute. It's a giant flying thing with red eyes. I guess it was supposedly in concert or a lot in line with this character. So they just dubbed it the Mothman. Um, we have another thing called the Flatwoods Monster where they did the same thing. It was an alien, man. It had nothing to do with <laughs> a wealth of knowledge, um, Mac Shrek, all sorts of things. Thank you very much for being very here welcome, with us. man. Godspeed, and I will talk to you guys uh, sooner than later, I hope. And hopefully, yes. we'll get out and play some shows with you guys one day. Yeah, hopefully. There you I, go. Love I would love that. That would make that would make Stevie Gould be very happy. I'm just going to sneak on stage and play with you guys if you don't. So. <laughs> yes, that sounds good. Hail Satan. <laughs>